Good morning and welcome to today's webcast, Not-for-Profit Accounting and Auditing Fall 2019 Update. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE Progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today, we'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. I'm pleased to introduce today's presenters from Moss Adams, Scott Simpson, partner, and Matt Parsons, senior manager. And with that, I'll turn it over to Scott to get us started. Thank you, Emily. Good morning and welcome to all of you on this fine October morning. I am Scott Simpson and I have been a partner with Moss Adams for the last 12 years. I work exclusively with exempt organizations uh, from higher education to independent <coughs> research organizations to social, social service organizations. With me today is Matt Parsons. Matt is a senior manager, also working exclusively in the not-for-profit area with a vast variety of organizations, many who have worked their way through the topics we will be covering today. Our learning objectives, at the end of this session, you'll be able to apply the lessons learned from the implementation of ASU 2016-14. We'll be covering ASU 2016-08, Revenue from Contracts with Customers. This is the RevRec or Topic 606 item. Some of you have implemented this already. Some others uh, will be implementing it probably next year. And then understanding changes to the disclosure requirements for fair value measurements. As Matt and I were discussing what to present on this webcast, we concluded that a refresher and lessons learned from these newly implemented standards would, would be most useful. We do understand that a lot of you on the call today have already implemented these, these uh, standards. Uh, there are some on the call today I'm sure that will be implementing uh, as of 1231. So some of this is going to be a repeat of things you've heard in the past, but what we're really hoping to do is to talk about some of the lessons learned, some of the things that we've seen uh, in, in our reviews and our audits to hopefully help you maybe think about some of your disclosures a little bit differently on a go-forward basis, or maybe even confirm that you got it right the first time. The agenda, 
we'll talk about, uh, we'll start off the presentation with a review of the NFP new financial reporting standard. We'll move into topic 606, revenue recognition, and then we'll move into some other recently issued standards and other noteworthy items. So with that, the NFP presentation of financial statements, this is topic 958. Over the past few months, we, we've seen a number of NFP organizations implement this new standard. And based on those implementations, we felt it would be good to go through the subject again. Uh, as I previously said, provide a refresher uh, to those who have yet to implement, but also go through a number of lessons learned from those implementations. Some of those implement implementations we've seen have been really great. Uh, we've, we've seen some outstanding disclosures. Um, and then there have been others that we've had to provide quite a bit of help to and that have needed some work. So we hope to show you some presentations or disclosures you might consider changing in to in the future or that might help you present your information in a way that is easier for the reader to understand. With that, let's get started. So this, this slide is just meant to be a refresher. We've got the provisions of uh, old gap, new gap, moving from the three buckets of net assets to the two buckets now without donor restrictions and with donor restrictions. You'll see there's some changes to underwater endowment um, where it was required to be disclosed in the past, or I should say recorded in the past. Now that it's required to be with donor restrictions, uh, netted with, and then board designated endowment. Uh, in the past, there was just disclosure with optional face presentation. Now there's expanded disclosure also with optional face presentation. So some disclosures required for each of these at net asset classes. For net, net assets without donor restrictions, you'll need to disclose information about the amounts and purposes of board designation of net assets without donor restrictions. You need to include <coughs> all, donor, all board designations, not only those board designations that have been previously accounted for as endowments or quasi-endowments. For net assets with donor restrictions, you'll continue to disclose this information about the nature and amounts of each of your donor-imposed restrictions with a focus on how and when the resources could be used. And this is rather than a bright line distinction between temporarily and permanent in kind of the old category. Some organizations have used a table plus paragraph format to disclose this information, describing in the paragraph format the how and when for specific donor restricted items. And here, I think we are going to start with our first polling question. So, Emily? All right, our first poll What nonprofit sector are you most closely aligned with? And your options are A, foundation, B, association, C, higher education, D, voluntary health and welfare, or E, other. And I'll give everyone a few moments to respond. To participate in our polls today, please click the button next to the answer you choose and hit submit. And if you have any difficulty seeing the polls, you may try refreshing your browser. Give everyone a couple more seconds here. And let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Scott, back to you. All right, it looks like we have a, a really nice mix today of uh, across the board, maybe a few less associations, but uh, overall a nice mix. Good. So now we're going to move into some of the implementation challenges. Although, the, and we'll start with really talking about the, the temporary and permanent references. So although the re reclassifications on the face of the financial statements were relatively easy to apply, 
the challenges came in updating the footnotes, and, and we saw this throughout a lot of audits that we did. In a perfunctory search through the financials, we frequently found references to terms unrestricted, temporary, and permanently restricted. And as often as you might, as often as you thought you had caught them, another one would pop out. And we saw this uh, a lot in the endowment section, uh, and we saw this uh, in some of the significant accounting policies as well. For endowments, it seemed that many preparers modified the descriptions and using language like restricted in perpetuity, time restricted, or purpose restricted to replace the outdated terms. So we did see some, some good, uh, good examples of implementing these uh, wording changes. References to unrestricted, uh, certainly not a new frustration for 501c3 organizations, but we did see this, uh, this is a challenge for some nonprofits that aren't charities that uh, maybe are more business focused that really never had uh, uh, the concept of uh, permanent or even temporary restricted assets. Um, so in those situations, what those organizations are allowed to do is simply refer to net assets uh, throughout the, the face of the financial statements, and then in footnote one, um, or the accounting policies footnote, define what the net, that the net assets are without donor restriction and that the organization does not have donor-restricted uh, net assets. The required elements for endowment disclosure did not change. However, with the collapsing of net assets, we noted in many cases required elements of the endowment disclosure were lost, and so those had to be reworked. For example, oftentimes references to the corpus or original gift was lost, and it was grouped with the accumulated gains. We saw that often underwater endowments were still classified as net assets without donor restriction, and we had to, again, help um, get those moved to the with donor restriction column. <clears throat> over the next few slides, we'll go over a couple of the endowment footnotes, um, footnote examples. So, with this next one here, the summary footnote shows the corpus plus accumulated gains or losses. Uh, this example also breaks down the type of funds for both donor restricted and without donor restrictions. So for instance, the scholarship support, general institutional support, or educational activity support. In this endowment, or this endowment footnote example, it's really focused on, it seems like, going through the required disclosures, so the, the NFP's policy, um, the aggregate fair value of such of the, of the funds, the aggregate amount of the original gift, and the aggregate amount on which funds are underwater, which are classified as part of net assets with donor restriction. So in this example, again, primarily just uh, with donor restriction, but it's just another example of how uh, one organization has elected to show uh, the endowment funds. And again, this is just a portion of the endowment footnote, not the entire uh, footnote itself. <clears throat> The third example, this is just showing with donor restrictions once again. Uh, this example highlights the underwater portion of their endowment in the aggregate, in the accumulated deficit line. So again, just another example of how to present some of the information required in the endowment footnote. And I think we're on to our next polling question. Emily? All right, our second poll. Are you currently undergoing a capital campaign? And your options are yes, 
know or I don't know. And as a reminder, if you would like to receive CPE credit for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions. Give everyone a few seconds to make a selection. And let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Back to you. Okay, so we have uh, about 20% of the audience that is uh, currently undergoing a capital campaign. And so we have a couple of things uh, related to capital campaign or things that can be impacted by the capital campaign that we wanted to talk about. Restrictions on PP&E, property, plant, and equipment. <clears throat> For the donations of or contributions restricted for property, plant, and equipment. <clears throat> you no longer can imply a time restriction if not designated by the donor. This also removes the option to release donor-imposed restrictions over the estimated life of the asset. And I'll show this in another slide here. And it requires you to use the placed in service approach. So you report expirations or restrictions uh, used to acquire or construct uh, PP&E, and you reclassify from that assets with donor restrictions to without donor restrictions at the beginning of the period adopted or, or at the placed in service date. So what you no longer do here is you no longer place it <clears throat> or release those funds, I should say, as those funds are expended. You release it once it is placed in service. In the absence of donor restricted, of uh, explicit donor restrictions, not-for-profits would be required to place, to use the placed in service approach. And uh, this is consistent with what healthcare not-for-profits have been already required to do. So if you are a healthcare NFP on the webcast today, you've already experienced this. Uh, if not, then this is going to be a, a new approach for you. <clears throat> so an example here. Your organization has undergone a capital campaign for several years, raising funds for a new performing arts center. During the year, you break ground and make considerable headway on construction and have paid or you've capitalized $4 million of the costs at year end. How would you report the release of those restrictions from the with donor restrictions to without donor restrictions? And so here's an example uh, of you would not. No, restrict, no releases would occur <clears throat> until the Performing Arts Center is placed in service. And so here's Statement of Activities example for that uh, same scenario. <clears throat> you would not release those funds from with donor restrictions to without donor restrictions. Now the difference would be if you had placed that building in service. At that time, you would release from with donor restrictions to without donor restrictions. So again, it's placed in service is really the key date there. <clears throat> with that, we're going to move to liquidity and availability. With liquidity, there's, uh, this is a new required disclosure. You have to disclose qualitative as well as quantitative information. Qualitative should explain how liquid resources are available within one year of the date of the statement of financial position and how those resources are managed. <clears throat> the qualitative, quantitative information is the total financial assets available to meet cash needs within one year. 
there's the definition of financial assets. And really it comes down to what you can convert um, into liquid uh, liquid assets. Uh, so can you can so cash, obviously, investments, but then do you have receivables that can be converted into liquid um, liquid items? Um, I did work with a nonprofit this year that's uh, that's in a retail environment. Some of their inventory is considered considered to be liquid. So <clears throat> really important to focus on what that definition of financial asset is. And we did have really a, a number of implementation challenges with, with this liquidity and availability disclosure, and we'll go into some of the things that we've seen uh, this past year. Just a quick refresher, old GAAP, there was no required disclosure, new GAAP required quantitative or qualitative disclosure. And there is some discussion that, uh, that the disclosure did not go far enough, really because it doesn't provide the context for the liquidity. Uh, I've seen in some uh, disclosures uh, for a number of not-for-profits, they did a really good job of describing context, and then others really just put the bare minimums of, of the requirement, and there wasn't a lot of context in, in the new disclosure. <clears throat> so some of the implementation challenges. We've seen a few examples of organizations reducing their financial assets available for use by the current liabilities, such as accounts payable or current, other current liabilities. Really the focus of this, this disclosure is on assets rather than liabilities. And none of the FASB examples include reduction of assets or current li reduction of assets by current liabilities. So in this situation, um, again, focus on what your assets are, not the liabilities. <clears throat> For organizations with consolidated entities, we've encountered confusion over whether financial assets of subsidiaries should be deducted from financial assets available for use because the use of those assets may be more limited <clears throat> than for the organization as a whole. But what you should do is you should use uh, the, the financial assets of those consolidating subsidiaries in that liquidity disclosure. <clears throat> Cash spent already for restricted resources at the end of the year but still restricted by a capital campaign until the asset is complete. Um, really, the cash already spent can't be included, uh, obviously, in the liquidity disclosure. Uh, remember that second year presentation is required. So it, when, in going forward in the, your 2020 financial statements, you will be required to have two, two years or comparative uh, disclosures on liquidity. <clears throat> And we've seen a lot of uh, a number of organizations include contributions receivable in the liquidity disclosure. However, upon further investigations, in a number of those cases, the contributions are restricted by the donor, and thus should not be considered liquid resources. So again, be careful of that. And, and if you've done that, if you've included contributions receivable. Uh, you want to go through and make sure that none of those contributions are restricted. <clears throat> lines of credit. Uh, we've seen a number of organizations forget to include lines of credit in their liquidity disclosure. Uh, I would say I've, the, by far the most common method that I've seen is a disclosure of it rather than the line of credit included in the calculation. Same with quasi-endowments. I've seen a number of organizations include quasi-endowments, uh, but I've actually seen a couple situations where the, the board will set aside a, quasi, a portion of their uh, income every year into the quasi-endowment, and the quasi-endowment um, actually can be exceed what the total 
um, without donor restricted net assets are. So I've seen some situations where uh, without donor restrictions, quasi endowment has a positive number, and then other it has a negative number. So be careful of the quasi endowments. I've seen several organizations uh, show their entire assets in their financial resources and then back out things like fixed assets and inventory when calculating liquidity. Uh, remember that fixed assets are not financial resources, so just uh, be careful of, of what you're including, whether they're the financial assets or if, they're, if you're including non-financial assets. Those really shouldn't be included in the liquidity disclosures. So let's move on to a couple examples here. First example, uh, qualitative information. This just shows that the, they're really talking about uh, what, the, what their goal is. Uh, to, they want to have a goal to have consistent cash on hand to meet 60 days of normal operating expenses. Um, so again, and then it talks about their investment policy. So really this organization explains how it's managing its liquid resources. So just one example. Another example, qualitative information table format. Here's an example of disclosure in which the entity begins with disclosing all financial assets and then they remove those assets unavailable for general expenditure in the next year. So we start off with about 98 million and then reduce those assets from things, from items such as investments held in trust, long-term receivables, endowments and board designated endowments, and then you come up with a liquidity or financial assets available to meet cash needs within one year of 29 million. One of the biggest challenges has been for management or the board to find ways to articulate these balances to other disclosures in the financial statements. However, reducing financial assets by total endowments might not make sense where the, if there are contributions receivable feeding into the endowment amounts and that those amounts have already been excluded. So it, we've seen these liquidity uh, disclosures be, be fairly complicated uh, for something that sounds so uh, on the surface uh, so simple. And then here's uh, a third example. Uh, again, just uh, another presentation style. This is backing out funds restricted by the bondholder. Okay, let's move into a scenario. So your organization has undergone a capital campaign for several years, raising funds for a new performing arts center. During the year, you break ground, make considerable headway on the construction, and have paid or capitalized $4 million of costs at year end. However, we learned, at the, as we last learned, this did not result in a release of net assets with donor restrictions. So how would that $4 million be evaluated in liquidity. <clears throat> well, it, it, to be fair, this is a little bit of a trick question because that $4 million has been spent on fixed assets. Therefore, you do not have a financial asset. There would be no need to further reduce the financial assets to include all the net assets with donor restrictions as the $4 million does not exist as a financial asset any longer. Expense reporting, uh, so old gap, new gap. Old gap, you had the functional uh, requirement on the statement of activities. Now you have to also uh, include natural classifications, and that can be shown in either the, the financial statements or in the footnotes. Uh, the second part of this is uh, the disclosure. So in the past, you had a requirement for general policy on functional allocation. 
And now you need to describe the method for that allocation. And this is one area that I have seen uh, is a lot of organizations miss this uh, in first round of, of uh, review, uh, that they aren't including that description for method of allocation. So implementation challenges uh, for the, the expense reporting. A depreciation breakout is often grouped with other expenses, and then the amounts don't articulate and uh, tie to other descriptions of depreciation. So, so that can be one area. Uh, investment expenses are still reported in functional expenses. <clears throat> I've seen that as another challenge not fully describing the allocation method used. I just mentioned that. Uh, it's no longer sufficient to just state that the allocation was made on a reasonable basis. Many questions arose with 990 reporting and the consistency, so be aware of that. Many struggled with special event expensing. And even though this is not new guidance, uh, for some, they hadn't reviewed in a while, and so this wound up really modifying their reporting. <clears throat> and then national dues. And again, although the guidance didn't change for these expenses, um, seeing them in a table or statement really brought that question back into, uh, back into the game. Here's an example. Um, so depreciation here. Uh, the question would be, and, and I know as, a, as an auditor and, and reviewer of financial statements, I'm going to ask the question, does it tie back to the statement of cash flow or the fixed asset disclosures? <clears throat> Has it been grouped with other accounts in certain places? And, and, and you know, just the confusion that that can cause. And just make sure that uh, this is a, a requirement, the expense reporting, you do have to show comparative on a go-forward basis. <clears throat> There's a great uh, a footnote on the functional allocation of those expenses, really the methodology. And as I noted earlier, uh, that uh, in a lot of financial statements, the disclosure was missing in a number of, of cases when I reviewed the first draft. It eventually made it its way into those financials, but it was it was more like an afterthought. Uh, and here, this is just a good example of uh, of uh, how how to include it in your in your significant accounting policies in a in a fairly simple, straightforward, and, and easy manner. With that, I think we're going to move over to Matt to talk about revenue. Matt, thanks, Scott. That was a great recap. All right, so the next topic we're going to be talking about is uh, revenue recognition. Um, clearly, this is not a new standard. There's been a significant discussion on this topic over the past several years um, since the update was first introduced way back in 2014. And we've seen a suite of supplementary updates issued to clarify the original guidance that was given. However, now that the implementation is finally upon us, in fact, I know many nonprofit organizations uh, already adopted this standard this year if they were considered a public entity. Uh, we thought it was still important to refresh the guidance and take a deeper look into what areas have been challenging to adopt in this new standard. Uh, so just very quickly as a reminder, uh, the focus is to apply a one principle-based standard as a baseline to use for every type of contract with a customer, so regardless of the industry. Um, and then from there, the standard has branched out depending on unique circumstances affecting the specific contracts and or those industries. So overall, applying the new guidance in ASC Topic 606 uh, really requires a change in our mindset. Uh, much of legacy gap is built around this risk and reward notion, um, where this model of revenue is recognized when substantially all the risk of loss from the sale of goods or services has passed on to the customer. Um, and so the trigger of revenue recognition under topic 606 is basically is based on that transfer of control over the good or service to the customer. Um, and as a result, the new model could lead to some different recognition patterns and amounts than what we've historically seen. Um, in, some in some circumstances, the new five-step process uh, may result in the same substantially similar accounting as legacy gap, 
but the logic and reasoning for reaching those conclusions may change. And regardless of the accounting income, uh, it's nearly certain the disclosures required under Topic 606 will be more detailed uh, and require considerably more time to prepare as compared to what uh, most organizations have provided under Legacy Gap. Um, as I just mentioned, for non-public entities, uh, this is effective now, really regardless of your, your year end. Um, and so uh, the onus is upon us to apply to all contracts um, right now because it really goes back to the beginning of the year. Um, and I suppose maybe those lucky November year ends folks have uh, not crossed the threshold, but they will be uh, joining soon enough. So this, let's see. So this slide summarizes really the five-step process used to approach your review of contracts. Uh, we'll touch on the most common types of contracts that really affect nonprofits um, over the next couple slides, but I wanted to share just one example to help us visualize uh, this process. So, a, for example, a typical member association that uh, collects dues. Uh, the first step is really identifying whether the terms in the agreement meet the definition of a contract with a customer. So the longer the industry has had time to really evaluate the standard, and we've seen more and more member associations identify that maybe their membership dues more closely follow a contribution model for revenue recognition than really a contract with a customer if there's not really a clear exchange or performance obligation required of that member uh, association. So for those entities that have determined that membership dues are in fact a contract with a customer, they first must analyze what those performance obligations are, um, which may include legal or political advocacy, um, subscription to a newsletter, maybe a registration to an upcoming conference, um, and other just basic member membership privileges. Uh, but portions of the membership may still be determined to be a contribution. Uh, for example, I know a number of associations I work with have scholarship funds to um, improve innovation within the industry, and so um, an element of that um, actual due member um, might follow a different model. So it just makes it that much more challenging in, in evaluating the standard. Um, so to reframe this, the questions we're required to ask when evaluating a contract is, could a member benefit from each of those obligations on its own? and could the performance obligation be separated from other goods or services promised? And oftentimes what we've seen is that many membership benefits really can't be separated from each other, um, and so they might be based under one general membership service when determining that performance obligation. Um, the next step is to determine the transaction price, uh, and this can be challenging too to apply, because even for a fixed price arrangement, um, Topic 606 requires organizations to consider potential discounts, concessions, rights of return, uh, liquidated damages, performance bonuses, all, all those types of things when evaluating uh, the calculation of the transaction price. So that's just one example, and we'll kind of highlight through a few other um, common nonprofit revenue streams. So this slide um, summarizes the accounting impact of many, not, of many traditional non-for-profit revenue streams. Um, although a couple here are red, um, even those are only demonstrated to really have had a moderate impact so far. Um, as you can see, a lot of the revenue streams uh, we see in nonprofits that get a pass. Uh, so grants and contracts and contributions, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, revised guidance that's come out uh, recently. Um, investment income, rental income, um, and split interest agreements um, are all um, scoped out of this standard, uh, which is helpful. Um, and then on the next slide, we'll cover some of the revenue streams that fall under other income. Uh, so we've talked pretty extensively about uh, membership and sort of how that cycle applies. Um, many other organizations that run, say, a thrift store or sell inventory, such as books or other merchandise, um, just as a reminder, this would fall under this scope. Um, generally, direct point-of-sale transactions are, are relatively easy to assess in the five steps, um, which frequently happen all simultaneously. Um, but one thing to be uh, aware of is how the impact of gift cards or returns um, and those types of elements uh, might need to be assessed under the standard, um, and especially some of the disclosure elements associated with those um, uh, arrangements. Uh, licenses for symbolic intellectual property have become more popular, uh, as many as, as many nonprofits um, we're seeing are starting to receive uh, revenue for use of their brand name or their logo. Um, one of the suites uh, standards that I mentioned earlier, ASU 2016-10, uh, gives better clarification of whether a licensing revenue should be recognized at just a point in time or over time. 
uh, based on whether the license provides the right to use the intellectual property or just the right to access that intellectual property. And so specifically, if the intellectual property has significant standalone functionality, the license doesn't uh, does not include supporting or maintaining the intellectual property over the license period. Therefore, the performance obligation would actually be considered satisfied at one point in time. Um, and examples of this type would include like your basic software uh, that you might license. Um, in other cases, performance obligation uh, is for the nonprofit to maintain a good standing reputationally. Um, and in that case, what we're seeing is that the, this example would re result in revenue being recognized uh, really rateably over time of that agreement. Uh, with more nonprofits using web traffic to generate advertising revenue, um, it's really important to know how that contract has been established. Uh, if it's based on specific clicks on a site, uh, generally we'd see revenue recognized you know, as those clicks occur. Um, however, there may be more unique circumstances to consider, and, and spending some time diving into those uh, arrangements is, is key. Uh, for other organizations that see patients or perform other healthcare services, um, there are a number of factors to eliminate, uh, to evaluate, uh, primarily for self-pay patients um, and determination of whether a contract even exists. I know some implications we've seen as being challenging is um, evaluation of bad debts and um, the new requirement to remove those expenses um, down below as an actual expense, um, whereas historically they might have uh, reduced the revenue amount. Um, and then, you know, really overall, we're seeing bad debt expense decreasing significantly compared to what's been disclosed in the past uh, based on the rules of the standard. Moving on. Um, so here's some of the challenges for implementers that we've seen um, uh, that have already uh, gone through this process. Um, you know, as expected, the first challenge has been the process of gathering all the contracts. In many cases, the finance department has had to solicit the help of other departments, you know, really just to gather the information they need. And sometimes the versions that have been retained within finance historically, we found have been outdated um, or missing key pages, uh, provisions that really help them in applying the standard. Uh, which leads to the second challenge is in trying to evaluate those contracts from memory. Uh, many of my clients um, you know, really under, underestimated the, the standard and, and delayed reviewing their contracts because they were um, operating off of their memory, recalling uh, what they thought the contract stated. However, when they finally got their hands on an executed copy, they often found more unique instances of variable consideration um, and other performance obligations um, that weren't uh, originally called to mind. And although um, in practice it hasn't been spelled out um, in other uh, actual contract terms. Uh, many discussions have also arisen over materiality and really whether it's worth the time and effort to go through the exercise of evaluating these contracts. Um, and while like many cases that may fall into this category, uh, we do want to caution organizations as we've already seen, uh, you know, cases where contracts that, you know, maybe it may have been immaterial in the past have now pivoted. Um, and so it's important that you really have an understanding and idea um, of how those contracts should be treated um, in the future so that um, you, you're aware as, as those uh, revenue streams grow or are modified. Um, just as a reminder, this isn't a one-time exercise. We're not just doing it um, for this year of implementation. It will be um, in place for years to come. So as you enter into new contracts, um, it really is a good idea to have a practice in place and you get acquainted with these rules so that you know how to apply them going forward um, and also provide advice um, to other members of your management as they look at um, new contracts or revenue streams uh, to bring into your organization. Uh, another less, lesson learned has been uh, modifying your controls um, and other policies and procedures really to ensure that those responsible for making decisions on contract terms understand the impl implication they could have on the accounting. And, you know, that's not to say that accounting is the most important part of any contract, uh, as much as accounting folks would like to be the case. Uh, so communication with other members of management, uh, making them aware of uh, your responsibilities and how to apply the standard is really key so that we can all be on the same page. Um, when a contract term has a refund cutoff date or there's cancellation policies included, you know, we've seen this impact of this have a really significant impact on understanding the conceptual application of the standard. And these may or may not have an impact on when the revenue is recognized under the five-step method. Uh, for example, I know institutions of higher, higher education 
often have dates within a term that could result in a refund to the student. However, generally the performance obligation of providing an education takes place rightably over the term. So just because a refund date exists doesn't mean that in general tuition hasn't been earned. So in many cases an assessment is used um, where you're with set an expectation for the value method, method where you would look at the probability of weighted amounts and other ranges of possible income, such as uh, the percentage of students that have withdrawn before the refund date. Um, finally, we've noticed instances in which policies and procedures may be in direct conflict with the terms actually set in these agreements. Uh, so, for example, using that tuition as in our last uh, discussion, um, we found inconsistencies between the refund terms and cancellation policies that are spelled out compared to what's actually in those contracts with those students. So this just might require some additional time um, to working to resolve those conflicts to ensure they're consistent. Um, some other challenges specific to higher education, um, you know, pres the presentation of tuition on the statement of activities um, really this applies to any revenue stream, but uh, we're no longer allowed to show uh, any discounts or allowances. Um, now that will be shown as a net amount. Um, concessions such as institutional aid would, would not be presented on the face of financials. However, um, this historical information um, could be presented in the, in the footnotes to the financial statements to give the, the reviewers and the readers that context. Um, however, this leads to the next challenging discussion, which is the methodology for applying concessions or discounts to those contracts. Uh, many have argued that a contract with a student for tuition, um, housing, and meal plans are all one contract, while others have determined that they're three separate contracts. So when you're determining that transaction price, Many organizations vary on how the discount rates are applied um, against each of those contracts or if at all. Um, so the key is to really, again, go back to what the terms of your specific contracts are and have those conversations uh, within your management group to get uh, what the best consensus is. Uh, and finally, we've seen the common practices where auxiliary revenue uh, is ignored or assessed as being immaterial when applying the standard. However, we're noting, you know, really many institutions have summer programs or athletic contracts for use of dorms, fields, or other facilities, um, and use of staff. And many times these do meet technically the definition of a contract with a customer. Um, some additional disclosures. So really the objective of um, these disclosures is to allow a financial statement user to understand the nature, the amount, the timing, and uncertainty of revenue and cash flows from contracts with customers. Therefore, you know, more disaggregation of revenue streams might be required um, as presented on your statement of activities than what's historically been presented. And as organizations find themselves you know, looking for revenue streams beyond that of traditional contribution models, we're seeing more and more complex and unique revenues that this might apply to. So for example, totals should be presented for each of those revenue streams. Um, other items to consider would be uh, the goods or services provided, for example, again, membership revenue, subscriptions, tuition, um, and then that policy and other qualitative disclosures might include you know, the type of customer, the type of contract, and the geographical location associated with that revenue stream. Um, while roll forwards themselves um, in a tabular format aren't required, it often is the most effective way to meet the disclosure requirements, um, which include reporting the beginning and ending balances of your receivables, um, any contract assets and liabilities, um, and the amount of revenue recognized in the period um, including that contract liability at the beginning of the year, and also an explanation of the satisfaction of the performance obligations that match up to the payments. So here's just a, a brief um, example of what we're seeing some um, entities report uh, as part of that contract liability or deferred revenue uh, roll forward. All right, so I think we have another polling question, Emily. All right, our third polling question. With respect to revenue recognition implementation, where is your team at? A, already implemented. B, assessed and determined minimal impact. C, assessed and determined moderate impact. D, assessed and determined substantial impact. Or B, not assessed yet at all. And for those of you that would like a copy of today's slide deck, you can download them from the folder that says slide deck and handouts to the right of the slide view. We will also be sending the slides via email after the webcast. 
And I'll give everyone a couple more seconds here. And let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Matt, back to you. All right, thank you so much, Emily. Looks like we've got good representation over the board over uh, those that have already implemented and those that are still assessing or not assessed at all. So hopefully this uh, discussion is relevant and important, helpful for everyone. All right. So the next topic we're going to talk a little bit of time over is uh, grants and contracts under the new Accounting Standards Update 2018-08. Um, in our last webcast, we did go over some pretty good examples um, of scenarios. Um, definitely want to bring that to your attention. Uh, since uh, right now, we're just really going to refocus on um, the high-level sort of um, way the revenue uh, could be recognized and then uh, skip over to talk a little bit more closely about the new fair value standard. So just as a reminder, um, you know, this standard arose um, when uh, some additional questions came out over how uh, Topic 666 or revenue recognition would apply um, to, you know, a lot of our grants. Uh, contracts that we have. Um, and so FASB came out with some additional information really looking at whether um, those transactions are reciprocal or non-reciprocal in, in, in nature. Um, because contributions are voluntary um, and non-reciprocal, those are, as I discussed, or, or have been scoped out of the standard. Um, but again, there might be other scenarios beyond just traditional contributions that would uh, need to be assessed, and uh, we'll take a couple minutes looking at that. All right, just as a reminder, this does apply to all um, entities, um, both those that receive contributions and also make contributions, um, and it excludes the transfer of assets from government to business type entities. All right, so um, looking at reciprocal or non-reciprocal transactions, uh, really we're getting at is, is, is the resource provider, whether it be a government or not, are they receiving a direct benefit um, by providing these resources? Um, or is the benefit really going to society as a whole? Um, and so in that scenario, um, as you'd expect, we're not seeing that really meet the definition of an exchange type transaction. And so this is where additional guidance has come in. Um, as a reminder, you know, feel-good sentiment doesn't constitute um, as a commensurate value received, um, so it probably needs to fo follow the um, more traditional uh, contribution model. All right. Um, so just one brief scenario here to talk about. Um, let's say a nonprofit receives a federal award. Um, the terms of that award require following the uniform guidance and other rules established under the Federal Office of Management Budget. Um, let's say it's a research project, for example, that requires a nonprofit to provide research findings. Um, however, if a nonprofit retains the rights to those findings, would this really be considered an exchange or a non-exchange transaction? And so I think most of us um, are familiar enough with the rules to now say, yeah, this is really not be considered uh, a transac an exchange transaction um, because there isn't really a value being received back from uh, the federal government providing that award. So what's the next step? So the next step is really looking at whether or not um, it meets the definition of a conditional uh, contribution or an unconditional contribution. Um, and it focuses on, um, in this scenario, the resource provider, regardless of, again, whether it's a governmental entity or not, um, if there's a clear right of return and a barrier. Um, so this condition can be the over, in the overall agreement, uh, but generally we've determined that OMB guidance um, does have um, a general restriction that uh, provides a, a barrier, um, and so probably would follow the conditional model um, as reported here. So in the sake of time, we're going to uh, jump a little bit ahead, talk about the fair value standard. So I think that brings us to our uh, last polling question. All right, our final poll. Which of the following fair value disclosures will no longer be required for non-public entities after implementation of ASU 2018-13? And your options are A, level three, roll forward, B, the amount of and reasons for transfers out of level one and level two in the FB hierarchy, C, the policy for timing of transfers, D, the valuation processes for level three fair value measurements, or E, all of the above, and once you have completed all CPE requirements, 
you will be able to download a PDF of your CPE certificate from the CPE progress window to the right of the slide view. And let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Back to you. Perfect. Great. Looks like all of you are overachievers and uh, have maybe read the standard already um, to know that, yep, all of the above um, are uh, uh, no longer technically required under the standard. So we'll just touch on this real briefly in the next few minutes that we have left. Um, so I think the slides are pretty good at um, highlighting what um, is allowed to be removed. Um, one thing I just really wanted to point out was that, um, you know, originally the FASB relied too heavily on subjective information that could have been misinterpreted. And it strengthens, this strengthens remaining disclosures to provide really an increased transparency uh, for estimates and assumptions used in valuation. And what this st new standard really does is it eliminates the at a minimum phrasing. So it doesn't require that these all these be removed from the disclosures, but it gives each entity um, more discretion in how they uh, value these disclosures and, and what impact they might believe that uh, users have. Um, so some items that are long, no longer required, um, I see here in the slide, are the amount of and reasons for transfers between level one and level two in the fair value hierarchy. Um, essentially, FASB did not believe that the benefits of this disclosure outweigh the cost of, of tracking and being able to implement this. Um, the timing of transfers between levels, you know, currently an entity is required to disclose and follow a consistent policy for the timing of transfers between the fair value levels. For example, the, the event date, the beginning or end of the period. Um, and an entity must still apply a consistent policy for the timing of transfers. However, it's no longer has to have a policy, um, which I know a, a number of entities are excited about. Uh, and third is uh, evaluation process for level three value measurements. And then finally, for um, non-public entities, uh, which I know include most nonprofits, uh, the change in unrealized gains and losses for the period, including those earned for level three recur recurring measurements. All right. Um, so the following disclosures also were modified under the standard. Um, non-public entities are no longer required to prepare a roll forward for level three instruments. Um, however, you still will be required to disclose transfers into and out of level three. Um, and more specifically, any purchases or issues um, still need to be disclosed somewhere within the footnotes. Um, and so some have determined that a, a roll forward is still appropriate. Um, but really the reason why this came about was that FASB was contemplating whether to include a roll forward for even level one and level two investments. Um, however, I think practitioners all argued that that would be a lot more labor intensive um, as a, of a process uh, and not beneficial. Uh, so ultimately FASB determined to remove the requirement for level three um, investments or other instruments as well. Um, the measurement uncertainty disclosure that relates to uncertainty um, and whether there are sensitivity changes in the future, uh, this disclosure intends to you know, really convey measurement uncertainty because of unobservable inputs that could um, have a different, uh, be different at the reporting date uh, rather than sensitivity to expected future changes. And then for investments uh, in certain entities that calculate net asset value, um, companies will be required to disclose the estimated time of uh, liquidation of an investee's assets and the date when the redemption restrictions might lapse, but only if the investment has been uh, communicated and information to the reporting entity has been announced um, publicly. So those are key. All right, so I know that we are at the end of our time. I know Emily wanted to provide some last minute um, follow-up logistics and other information. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Scott, and thank you, Matt, for a great presentation today. Um, as Matt mentioned, we are right at the end of the presentation, uh, so unfortunately we don't have time for questions. Uh, we will do our best to follow up with you after the webcast, uh, and you may reach out to Scott or Matt directly uh, with more questions. As a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in the slide deck and handouts window to the right of the slide view. If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. I'll keep the webcast console open for a few minutes to give you time to download your CPE certificate. A copy will be emailed within three weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now.
Here is a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining us and we hope you'll join us again next time.